Glory to Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And so we learn, brothers and sisters, that the scriptures, plural, they testify of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. And therefore, we must not forget that when we are reading in the Old Covenant, we must be on the lookout for information about Yehoshua, about Jesus, about our Creator. And today we will be focusing on the book of Jonah, and more specifically, Jonah chapter 3, verse 6. Now, from the onset, I do want to establish that although we will be speaking about the king of Nineveh and Assyria, and these people were the enemies of the people of God, nonetheless, for the purpose of spiritual images, that can be edifying to us and can be used for instruction, we will still use the king of Nineveh as a prototype to study certain aspects of the faith and our walk with the Lord, and also to study what the Almighty did for us in terms of his excellent work at the cross to orchestrate our salvation in a most excellent way. Alleluia. Glory to Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so this preliminary explanation having been laid out, let us go on with our study. We are in the book of Jonah, chapter 3, and the verse of interest will be Jonah, chapter 3, verse 6. We are talking about when the king lays down his crown or when the king gets up from his throne. Verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And so from the onset, brothers and sisters, we see that Jonah was used as a useless servant of the Lord to go and carry a message to that great city Nineveh and preach unto it and deliver unto Nineveh a message, an important message that aimed at sparing them from the wrath of the Lord, if they did not repent. We know, brothers and sisters, from Romans chapter 10, verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher. And so here, brothers and sisters, we are reminded how as saints, as lights of the world, we are to enlighten the nations and share the good news of Jesus Christ in whatsoever capacity we are called to do it so that the nations in darkness can understand and know that there is a clear warning from God that he doth not acquit the wicked, but rather that he will spare those who will put their faith in Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, the Son of God. And so, brothers and sisters, here Jonah is used as a preacher to carry the message, to carry the light, a message of hope through repentance to Nineveh so that the people may be spared from God's wrath. And this is a reminder to us, the church, a reminder to us, the saints, that we are the light of the world and that our light must shine so that the nations in darkness may perceive it and hear about the good news of the gospel, that in this corrupt world, which is appointed to destruction, there is salvation, which is that they can have eternal life by putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and abiding in his doctrine until the end. And so back at Jonah chapter 3, we read verse 2 again. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Verse 3, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh 
according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Verse four, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And so Jonah is called to cry out and he warned Nineveh, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This reminds us of both John the Baptist and Yeshua Jesus, as they will also preach a message according to which it is time for repentance. First, in the case of John the Baptist, we go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Verse 9, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And so this is the warning that John the Baptist first spoke to the Jews. And I mention it because it is parallel to the warning received in Nineveh in that they would be destroyed if they did not give heed to the warning and the message of repentance. Because indeed in verse 7, they are warned that there is a wrath to come. Yet in 40 days, Nineveh shall be destroyed. Now, as I said, Yeshua, Jesus, also had a similar message of repentance. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so, brothers and sisters, back at Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And so there is a clear warning by Jonah who is preaching to Nineveh. And in the same manner, we saw that John the Baptist issued out a warning and that Yeshua, Jesus, did likewise. Now we also know that unfortunately the people of God, Israel, and Judah also, they did not give heed to the warning that was given to them. Ironically, in Nineveh, a people, the Assyrians, who were not the people of the Lord, but who were rather, according to Isaiah, a rod in the hand of the Lord to punish his people, to correct them, to afflict them. They, ironically, not being the people of the Lord, will give heed immediately to the Lord's warning that is given them through Jonah. But as we will see in the book of Jeremiah, Israel and Judah did not listen to the Lord when they had received proper warning and this on numerous occasions. Jeremiah chapter three, verse three. Therefore the showers have been withholden and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a horse forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide of my youth? And so the people of the Lord were called to repentance, but they refused to do so. They refused to be ashamed, and they had a horse forehead. Not only the kingdom of Israel, but also the kingdom of Judah. Jeremiah, still in chapter 3, verse 6, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Verse 7, And I said, after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me, 
but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Verse 8, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 12, we read, My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. For the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a whoring from under their God. The spirit of whoredoms. And so we see that both in the kingdoms of Israel and of Judah, there was disobedience and rebellion concerning the ways of the Lord. And they were stiff-necked, and yet were they the people of the Lord. But the spirit of whoredom caused them to err. Whereas, brothers and sisters, the people in Nineveh, in Assyria, when they were given a proper warning from the Lord through Jonah, they will give heed to it, and they were not the people of the Lord. We go back to the book of Jonah, chapter 3. At verse 4 again, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What was the reaction of the people of Nineveh? How did they react considering that Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms, the people of the Lord, they were stiff-necked. But look at the Assyrians, people who were not the people of the Lord. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. And for what reason did the people of Nineveh believe God? We have an explanation in verse 6, and this is the main verse of our study. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And so this is very interesting, because we have many elements here that we are going to study in greater detail and expound on them. The word came unto the king of Nineveh. And so it begins with the king of Nineveh hearing the preaching of Jonah and giving heed to it. Now, the king of Nineveh is the head. He is the headship. He is above his people. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14, we read, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Now, what I find interesting is the first part of that verse, where no counsel is, the people fall. But the king of Nineveh here, being in a position of authority, is able to give advice to his people, and being the king, his advice becomes crucial. And the king of Nineveh here invited everyone to put on sackcloth and to repent. And all this because there was a preaching by Jonah who brought to them the truth, repent or else Nineveh will be destroyed yet 40 days. And so brothers and sisters, it reminds us that we have to speak the truth to the nations and that the word itself will have power to touch the hearts of the nations, to touch the hearts of the unconverted. We go to Proverbs chapter 27, verse five. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Jonah did not have love for the Assyrians. They were enemies, but he gave them an open rebuke. Verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And so again, this is the same idea that we have to preach the truth. And the power of the word who does not return void will have its effect. Here, the heart of the king of Nineveh is touched and he seeks to repent and he gives counsel and advice to his people as a ruler that they should do likewise. 
We are in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 5. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. And so the king of Nineveh, realizing that himself was abiding in wickedness, is willing to remove himself from that position of glory and put on sackcloth so that he can repent, so that he can be reinstated in his throne in righteousness. Take away that which is wicked from before the king or from before the throne. Verse 6, put not forth thyself in the presence of the king and stand not in the place of great men. If the king is not suited to lead this nation unto salvation, quote unquote, then he should step down. And that's exactly what he does. He humbles himself before the Lord. Verse 7, for better it is that it be said unto thee, come up hither, than that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. And so here, again, the king of Nineveh is willing to step down. He's willing to move further away from the throne, which is his as a king of Nineveh, so that he can be pleasant to the Lord and then wait on the Lord, reinstating him in his position after that he has put on righteousness. Amen. And this is what I wanted to outline to you from these verses. As I mentioned previously, there is headship. And when the headship is sick, when the head is sick, the whole body is sick. We read about that in Isaiah. And so, as I mentioned to you, the king of Nineveh is in a position of headship and he gives great counsel, good advice to his people, which will work to their being spared from the wrath of God. As a head, he gives them good advice. Malachi chapter 2, verse 7. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. And I like this analogy here because it reminds us that where the priests in the old covenant had a role, where they should be the ones to know the law and instruct the people, if they fell, then the people were led astray. If they departed out of the way, then they would cause many to stumble. There is a responsibility that you have as a light bearer to shine your light upon the nations. And if you don't, then the nations themselves do not have light. And if you become a blind leader, then the blind follow the blind and both fall into a ditch. And so here the analogy is that the king of Nineveh, who was in a position of leadership, in headship, in a similar manner to the priests, what he was going to decide was going to have an effect on the people of Nineveh. But thankfully, he made the right decision to choose to repent upon God, warning the nation in Nineveh that in 40 days, lest they repented, there would be wrath coming. And again, we can remember how both Israel and Judah, when they were given the same type of warning, they were stiff-necked and listed not. And here, people who are not the Lord's people, they give heed to the message. I think this is also an image for us to see how the nations ultimately are going to come in first. Those who were last were coming first. And Israel has been blinded for a time until the fullness of the nations be come in. And so ultimately, we see that the Lord will turn to the nations and extend their grace to them. We also have that spiritual image here. So speaking of headship, we have Isaiah chapter 1, verse 5. Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Such were the people of the Lord. But here in Nineveh, the king of Nineveh has led his people to humble themselves before the almighty God. We are back in the book of Jonah, chapter 3. We were at verse 5. So the people of Nineveh 
believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. Why? For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And so we dealt with a first aspect, which was the king of Nineveh as the head, as the leader who gave counsel to his people in an appropriate manner, who decided that he was going to abase himself and suffer the humiliation of stepping down from his throne, putting down his crown for a time to fast, as we're going to see, and to cover him with sackcloth and sit in ashes and fear the almighty God. And therefore the king of Nineveh set down his crown and accepted humiliation so that his wickedness could pass from him and that he would be reinstated in righteousness and accepted to humble himself for a time for the sake of his people and also delivered a message unto them that they should do likewise. And so the king made himself common. And so we have dealt with a first aspect whereby the king of Nineveh, as a leader of a people, as the headship, gave proper advice and counsel to his people that they should fear the Lord and humble themselves before him to cover themselves with sackcloth and to sit in ashes. The king of Nineveh himself accepts to arise from his throne, to set down his crown, to relinquish his royalty for a time, to become common among the people. He will invite them to follow suit and repent alongside himself, not only them, but also the beasts. Verse 7, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. And so there was a fast proclaimed and published as the king of Nineveh set down his crown in this time of affliction and even arose from his throne. Let us go to 1 Kings to speak about a spirit willing to repent. Let us go to 1 Kings chapter 21 at verse 27. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. Now, just so we remember this story, Ahab was king in Samaria, in the kingdom of Israel, and he was married to Jezebel. And Naboth, a Jezreelite, had a parcel of land that was part of his family inheritance given to him by the Lord. And that parcel of land was next to the palace of Ahab. And after Ahab unsuccessfully tried to get Naboth to sell him the land, or to accept moving from the land with compensation, Jezebel actually orchestrated a ploy so that Naboth would be killed, stoned. And then Ahab took possession of that land that Naboth did not want to sell because the Lord wanted him to keep his inheritance. And after this horrendous ploy, the Lord spoke prophecies and spoke about Ahab, saying that his house would be struck, and also that Jezebel would die and be eaten by dogs. Now, Ahab did a lot of evil, but the point I want to highlight here is the following. 
when Ahab humbled himself, look at what the Lord says in verse 29. Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. But in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. And so we see the power of repentance here. Although, granted, the punishment is going to come at a later time. The punishment is not annulled. The punishment is not altogether done away with. But the point is that Ahab humbled himself, and that pleased the Lord. And back at Jonah chapter 3, uh, verse 6, I was saying all this about Ahab just to point out that repentance makes a difference. Even in the case of Ahab, who was deemed to have done wicked things, repentance goes a long way with the Lord. And so here, in comparison with Ahab, the Ninevites, for now, they will be spared as they repent. But as we know, by the prophecies of Nahum, Nineveh will eventually be destroyed. But at the time of the book of Jonah, because the king of Nineveh led his people to repentance, they were spared from the wrath of the Lord that they were warned about by Jonah. And so I just wanted to contrast how Ahab, who did evil, by repenting, the Lord did take time to underline his repentance and how he was willing to put on sackcloth and repent. And so here back in Jonah chapter 3, verse 6, For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Verse 7, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Verse 10, and God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And so we see the power of repentance and humbling ourselves before the Lord. So when it comes to us saints, James chapter 4 verse 9, we have to remember that we also are called to humble ourselves before the Lord and to accept being put in a state where we are afflicted. James chapter 4, verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Because through the temptations that we go through, we are being brought unto perfection. Psalm 51 and 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. And so God appreciates a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. As saints, we must have this ability to humble ourselves before God and understand that the sacrifice that we're making is the sacrifice of ourselves, offering up our lives as a pleasant sacrifice to the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And offering your bodies a living sacrifice is to pick up your cross every day, to crucify the flesh and the lusts of it, so that you can walk by the Spirit. It is to deny yourself, because it is no longer you who is living, but Christ who is living in you. And so you must deny yourself. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me 
and gave himself for me. Amen. And so we are discussing the gospel, brothers and sisters, through this third chapter of Jonah. And as I announced, we will be focusing on Jonah chapter 3, verse 6, to examine what the Lord did for us, to remind ourselves the great and excellent work that the Lord did for us to orchestrate our salvation. But at the same time, like I said, also using Jonah and the people of Nineveh, we are also looking at different aspects of our spiritual life, of our walk in Christ, in Mashiach. So to put our ideas back in focus, we're going to read again from the top, Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So we mentioned about how we are beacons of light, and we bring the light to the nations who are in darkness. And how will they hear without a preacher? And so it was necessary for Jonah to get to Nineveh, and it's necessary for us to get up and be witnesses and shine our light in the world so that the nations may hear about the good news of Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us. Verse 3, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Obedience. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. And so the task at hand may seem grand, but we must rest assured that we can do all things through Christ. Philippians 4 and 13. Most of us know that verse. Verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And so in the same fashion that John the Baptist will come, and cry out a message of repentance to the Jews. Likewise, Yehoshua, Jesus, will also come and preach the same message, repent ye, for the kingdom is at hand. And in the case of Nineveh, though they be not the people of the Lord, but according to Isaiah, a rod of correction in the hand of the Lord, concerning his people, we are being instructed here, spiritually, how the Lord extends his grace to nations and how nations who are not originally the people of God can receive the message sometimes better than the people of the Lord who were supposed to be his people from the beginning. And so here the Assyrians in Nineveh are giving heed to the message of the Lord and the warning of the Lord when we have seen that both Israel and Judah refused to be ashamed and were influenced by the spirit of whoredom and rebelled against the Lord. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. No respect of persons. Verse 6, why did they react this way? Proper headship, proper counsel from the authorities, from the king and from his nobles, proper advice from those who are in a position to lead the masses. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and what did he do? He arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes." And so the king of Nineveh understood what we are to understand, that we must have a broken and contrite heart before the Lord, humble ourselves, understanding that we're not perfect, and humbling ourselves and allowing him to bring us to perfection. We must surrender our lives and allow the Lord to work through us. And we must aim to crucify our flesh so that we can have a new garment, a white robe. Here, the king of Nineveh understood that he had to get up from his throne, set down his crown for a time, and make himself common with the people where they would all be wearing sackcloth because he would have laid his robe from him and they would sit in ashes. 
a man. And so having already highlighted the aspect of the king of Nineveh being the head in a position of headship and having led his people properly by proper counsel, now we move to the second element, which has to do with the vesture, with the garment. You see the king of Nineveh, who was sitting on his throne, he arose from his throne. He got up and he laid his robe from him. He relinquished his kingship. He set down his crown. The king set down his crown and was made common. He covered him with sackcloth. He relinquished a royal vesture, a royal garment, and put on the common man's garment, and put on the poor man's garment, and put on the mourning man's garment, sackcloth, and sat in ashes. In other words, he abased himself from the kingship that he enjoyed. And this because he wanted to please the Lord and humble himself and repent. Here, brothers and sisters, as I was meditating upon this verse, the Lord intended to take me further in the book of Jonah and get beyond the point where we say Jonah is about being in the great fish's belly for three days. We've understood that part. Now the Lord wanted me to understand that this verse 6 actually points to the great and magnificent and excellent plan of the Lord, according to which he got up from his throne, set down his crown of glory, and relinquished his garment of kingship to come down and put on sinful flesh and put on a garment which spiritually is the image of sackcloth. He humbled himself and allowed himself to be made common like the human beings. This is a very powerful verse in that it also touches on the great work of the Almighty. We are talking about how the king sets down his crown. Obviously, you have to understand that the king of Nineveh was at fault and that the nation of Nineveh was at fault. When we are talking about the Almighty, he is holy and there is no darkness in him. So the analogy is about how a king becomes concerned for his nation and takes the initiative to abase himself at the level of the common people so that he can speak to them words of counsel about how they can be reinstated to righteousness, about how they can be reconciled with God yet again, without their iniquity creating distance between themselves and the Lord. Isaiah chapter 59. And so the king of Nineveh took the initiative to strip himself of the garment and vesture of glory of his throne, set down his crown, laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth. The Lord set down his crown and got up from his throne and came down and put on sinful flesh and suffered humiliation for a time so that ultimately the common people amidst whom he walked would be spared from the wrath to come exactly in the image of the king of Nineveh. And while he was among us, the Lord preached along with his apostles, along with his disciples in the image of the king of Nineveh and his nobles who published decrees about repentance in the image of the fasting that has been announced. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Does this not remind you about the works meet for repentance that John the Baptist was speaking of, meaning this is the image of depriving ourselves of the lusts of our flesh and overcoming them so that we may live holy and draw closer to the Lord and have communion with him. We are using spiritual images here. We are instructing ourselves about a verse very common 
Jonah chapter 3, verse 6. But we're going into deeper waters to understand that God, who said that the scriptures testify of him, do announce great things. But the Holy Spirit reveals them to us. How the king of Nineveh arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes and caused it to be proclaimed what should be done to be spared from the wrath to come. And the Lord himself got off his throne, set down his crown of glory for a time and put on sackcloth in the image of sinful flesh, humbling himself and caused it to be proclaimed the gospel of the good news of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, eternal life by believing on the Son of God. By having a broken and contrite heart and denying ourselves to follow him. Oh, hallelujah. And so let us continue to expound on this. We know from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, that God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. And so indeed God spoke through prophets so that they would give a warning to the people in the same way that Jonah brought a warning to the people of Nineveh. We read about Jeremiah who was a prophet who warned the people of God about a wrath to come, about the need to repent, to avoid the consequences of the wrath of the Lord. And the Lord therefore sought prophets to send unto his people. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, we read, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And so God sent different prophets at different times so that they would speak to men on behalf of the Lord and warn them about the importance to return unto him or else there would be consequences. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And so many people were sent. You remember the parable which alludes to this. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 35. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Verse 36. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the hare. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And so God sent prophets and ultimately his own son. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37. Those prophets, they were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Verse 39, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. And so essentially we see that prophets were sent and they were mistreated. Prophets who were trying to bring a message of light to the people of the Lord. Prophets who were trying to have the people reconcile with God and turn from iniquity. Now, let us stay in the train of thoughts. We are highlighting the fact that prophets were sent because, as it is written, the Son was sent last in the parable. And in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 3, we will see that likewise the Son of God was sent to speak in the last days, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. So we are in Romans chapter 8. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so God sent his own son. That's an important aspect to tie into what we were saying about the parable and about the fact that different prophets were sent. But lastly, the son, the son of God was sent last and he was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. And the important part I want to highlight here is that the son came and he put on sinful flesh. Remember, I spoke to you about how the king of Nineveh arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. This is the image of the Son of God in that God relinquished his glory to come indwell a human vessel of flesh, the Son of God, and thereby putting on sinful flesh in the image of sackcloth, in the image of having laid his robe from him in that he covered his spiritual glory and kingship and covered it with sackcloth. And so the idea is that he deprives himself of his divine kingship for a time to experience the flesh. And so the spirit of the almighty indwelled a human vessel of flesh in the person of the son of God, Jesus Christ, the man indwelled by the fullness of the spirit of God, the father indwelled by the fullness of the spirit of the almighty. And so God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, that's the image where the king of Nineveh has put on sackcloth. God has temporarily relinquished his kingship to come down among us and put on sackcloth and put on sinful flesh. Again, this is a spiritual image. So this was Romans chapter eight, uh, verses three and four. And so brothers and sisters to have a better idea about this concept of God humbling himself, putting on sinful flesh to come and condemn sin in the flesh. Let us go to Philippians chapter two, verse six. We're talking about the son of God, Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Are you following brothers and sisters? The king of Nineveh set down his crown and put off his royal garment and put on sackcloth. He was in the form of a king. He had kingship, but he decided for the good of his people to remove his royal garment to make himself common with the people by putting on sackcloth and sitting in ashes. He removed his king's apparel he got up from his throne and descended. The king of Nineveh did. And we have this image of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, doing the same thing. Who being in the form of God, having kingship, being the almighty, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men in that he put on sinful flesh. He put on sackcloth rather than the apparel of a king. And this for a time, he relinquished his kingship and this for the good of his people. Verse eight, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The king of Nineveh made a proclamation, a decree, that there should be fasting, no eating, no drinking, and that they would display a broken and contrite heart because that is the offering which is pleasant unto the Lord. 
And so the king of Nineveh brought everyone to humble themselves. And he did that with his nobles in the image of Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and his disciples, the image of the nobles, who also helped proclaim that repentance was in order. And so we have this further analogy where the nobles alongside the king, the disciples and the apostles alongside Yeshua, Jesus, proclaimed the message of repentance. As we saw earlier, John the Baptist preached repentance, Yeshua, Jesus preached repentance, and the disciples likewise. And so the king of Nineveh, by way of proclaiming that message that they should repent, and this decree was heard of everybody, and they gave heed to the decree and repented to avoid the wrath to come, the wrath of the Lord. And so the king humbled himself for that duration of time, for that period of time, and they all became obedient, even though it was difficult and they were fasting. We go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, again, to see how God, as a spirit, humbled himself by putting on sinful flesh, that is, to come to occupy a human vessel of flesh, the flesh of the man Jesus Christ, the Son of God, indwelled by the fullness of divinity. And so in that, God as a spirit humbled himself to partake in the things of the flesh, putting on his sinful flesh garment and relinquishing his kingship for a time. That's the spiritual image that we are discussing here. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. We are talking about how God put all things in subjection to the Son of God. Verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the Son of man, that thou visitest him? Verse 7, we are talking about a king abasing himself. Verse 7, thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. And so thou crownest him with glory and honor. The king of Nineveh was still king. He did set down his crown, meaning he humbled himself, but he still had the title of king, though he did not have the apparel. Verse 8, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. And we have here the image of the king of Nineveh, who abased himself and set down his crown, though he was still king according to his title, and put on sinful flesh, and fasted, and mourned, and put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes, so that he would get a taste of repentance and humility before God. And he did that for every man, in that he proclaimed and made a decree that everybody should do the same. And he gave the example by being a king who would demote his own self to repent because God said so and called him to do that. And so again, we see the image of a king abasing himself. We see the image of Jesus making himself a little lower. Though he is still king, setting down his crown so that he can make himself common, so that he can taste death for every man, so that he can partake in the weakness of the flesh and know the afflictions of the flesh for the sake of condemning sin and overcoming sin in the flesh and defeating that sinful flesh by the power of his spirit. 
so that he can then give it to us and we can do the same once that spirit is glorified. Verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And we have here the idea that Yeshua, Jesus, is our perfect example. And so, obviously, the king of Nineveh is not the Mashiach. He's not the savior. But what I'm saying is we have the image of him taking it upon himself to show the example to the people and give them good counsel by abasing himself and setting himself as an example for the people to follow and making a decree to repent. Now, let me be clear again, these are spiritual analogies and images we're using. We understand that there is only one Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and that the king of Nineveh certainly is not him, nor equal to him in any capacity, because the king of Nineveh was a sinner, and Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is the only one who did no sin. Hallelujah. We are now in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And so to give honor to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, we read on about more scriptures that show us and establish how he came to indwell a vessel of flesh, how the Almighty humbled himself in coming as a spirit to indwell a vessel of flesh of Jesus Christ, the man, the Son of God, and the great work he did for us. And he took time to make himself common, just like the king of Nineveh made himself common with the people wearing sackcloth. God made himself common by putting on that vesture of sinful flesh because he wanted to partake in the things of flesh and blood. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. We read earlier how he wanted to condemn sin in the flesh, and so he wanted to defeat the sinful flesh so that he could destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15 and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. He did not put on a vesture that was the vesture of an angel, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on him the sinful flesh of mankind. Why? Because he had to take on the form of mankind to save the form of mankind. Verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make a reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. And so God underwent having sinful flesh and experiencing sinful flesh. But by the power of his spirit, he sinned not and overcame the lusts of the flesh and obtained victory and therefore abolished death, which is the end of sin, which is the consequence of sin. And so to continue the analogy, the king of Nineveh made himself common put on sackcloth, sat in ashes, and no longer was in a palace with a king's attire, and humbled himself to know the condition of a repenting sinner who sits in ashes and puts on sackcloth before God and humbles himself with a broken and a contrite spirit. And so God, in order to have credibility concerning us, he had to know what we go through. And his spirit came and put on that vesture of a sinful flesh. He made himself common for a time. He abased himself and set down his crown and relinquished the garment of a king and put on the common garment of a sinful man. 
so that he could defeat it, hallelujah, and glorify his spirit. And then he sent that spirit to us that we may do the same as we are still in those earthly vessels. Do you think we have a God who is asking us to do so many things, but he never himself was subject to what we are experiencing? He would be a hypocrite if he did. And so it is a requirement that he himself would have touched on the things of the flesh before he would scold us about being weak in the flesh. Are you starting to understand, my friends? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Oh, we serve a mighty God. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We continue in Hebrews chapter 11 at verse 24. And here what I want to highlight is that God allowed himself to be uncomfortable. Having put on a vesture of sinful flesh, he abased himself, he suffered humiliation, and he allowed himself to be uncomfortable for a time for the salvation of the people, to orchestrate salvation for the people by defeating that sinful flesh. Again, by defeating that sinful flesh, by the power of his spirit, glorifying it, and then sending it to us that we may do the same. And so the idea is that for a time, he accepted great discomfort because from an earthly perspective, we know that his life was not easy. And in fact, only he could have lived the life that he lived, perfect life without sin. And so the image here concerning the king of Nineveh, who is not Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, we are using spiritual images to grow in understanding and knowledge of spiritual principles. The image here with the king of Nineveh is that he himself made himself common and was in discomfort, being stripped of his kingship of his fine linen clothing that kings would wear, of his royal apparel, and was wearing sackcloth and was uncomfortable for a time, but it was necessary so that salvation of the people would be orchestrated as he set himself as an example and made a decree and a proclamation of repentance being required of God to be spared from the wrath to come. Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You see, Moses could have chosen comfort and remained with Pharaoh's daughter. But what did he do? Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And so the king of Nineveh understood that if he repented, though it meant that for a time they would not be enjoying the lusts of their flesh, but that there would be fasting, not drinking, and that they would suffer for a time wearing sackcloth, sitting in ashes, deprived of his kingship, Deprived of his royal garment, having set his crown down, the king of Nineveh knew that this reproach of Christ, the reproach of God telling him to repent, or else in 40 days Nineveh would be destroyed, he knew that it was worth it to suffer that hardship so that there would be a reward, they would be spared the wrath to come. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, that is Moses, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And so Moses did not fear men. He did not fear earthly kings, but rather he feared God and therefore made the decision that he would leave Egypt. He would leave the comfort of a palace to suffer alongside his people and orchestrate their salvation. And so Moses also is another illustration of how the Lord orchestrated the salvation of his people, Moses did likewise, and Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, did likewise. 
And the king of Nineveh, if we use him as an image, he also forsook his royal throne and made himself common for a time and suffered for a time, broken and contrite heart for a time, so that his people who were under his headship, that they would escape the wrath to come by way of repentance. And he set the example himself by abasing himself, by humbling himself. And now, brothers and sisters, still in honor of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we will be reading Isaiah chapter 53. And this allows us to remember what the Lord went through for us, how he made himself uncomfortable for us, how he suffered for us, even saying, if it were possible that this cup pass from me, Father, but not my will, but your will. We have to be reminded how the Lord set his crown down and got up from his throne and came down and experienced our own hardships in the flesh because the flesh was in a fallen state by our fault because of our disobedience. But he came, he who did no sin, he in whom there was no darkness, he who is light, he came because he loved us and he suffered for us and he took on the penalty for us, the penalty for our iniquity that we deserved. And so we must give him honor. Isaiah chapter 53. We are talking about when the king sets down his crown, gets up from his throne, and comes down. Verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The Lord did not make himself comely. Just like the king of Nineveh did not make himself comely. He came wearing sackcloth, not to catch the eye. And so when he set down his crown and came down, he wore sackcloth in that he wore sinful flesh. But further, he wore sackcloth in that the sinful flesh he had did not catch the eye. There is no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so the Lord took upon him our iniquity when we were lost, when we were confused, not knowing our left from our right. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. And should not I spare Nineveh? that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. So God saw that the people of Nineveh did not know their left from their right. They were sinners, and yet he had mercy on them. We also were lost, and God had mercy on us. Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, had mercy on us and took upon us the penalty for our own wickedness. We continue Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opens not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, 
and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He made himself common, in other words, and he was able to bear the iniquity of those amidst whom he came. He came amongst his own, and they received him not. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He shall justify many. After that, he has come for a time to humble himself and suffer and put on that vesture of sinful flesh rather than the vesture that is royal of his kingship, and he shall bear their iniquities. He shall suffer. He shall have a broken and a contrite heart and shall carry out his work until the end so that he can orchestrate their salvation and ensure the remission of their sins. Verse 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He was numbered with the transgressors. He made himself as one of them, though he alone did no sin. But he was made like unto his brethren to succour them. And again, he did no sin. Alleluia. Amen. And so we are back at Jonah chapter 3, verse 6. You remember, brothers and sisters, how we were looking at the king of Nineveh as the head who led the people to emulate him and repent and cover themselves with sackcloth, sit in ashes and fast. And we had mentioned also the second element, which was that he arose from his throne and set down his crown. He laid his robe from him, and then that brought us the deal with the aspect of vesture and making an analogy with the sinful flesh that God put on the human vessel of flesh, Jesus Christ, the man, indwelled by the spirit of God. And so we are talking about the vesture, and we have seen that God also put himself in an uncomfortable position for a time, abasing himself and putting on a vesture that was not royal, but a sinful flesh vesture which is the image of him putting on sackcloth and sitting in ashes because it was a vesture of dust that was of corruptible seed and had become corrupt. Alleluia. And so when we talk about vesture, we understand that the origin of that sinful flesh, of that vesture, well, it goes back in the beginning. Adam sinned and the vesture that he had, a flesh that was corruptible, it was of a corruptible seed while well, it became corrupt at the fall of man and it became a vesture of sinful flesh. Genesis chapter three, verse 10. And this is Adam speaking. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, speaking to God. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Adam was naked because the vesture of glory, the vesture of kingship that he had, that he was covered with, he lost it. He was stripped of it because at the fall of man, the corruptible seed was made corrupt. And so there was a change there where his vesture lost glory. And the kingship he had, having been given dominion over the earth, that kingship, he was stripped of it. And now he became himself in bondage to sin, a servant of sin. This is why the Bible says death, which is the result of sin, death ruled 
from Adam to Moses until the law was given. Now, ultimately, we understand that even the law did not remedy sin itself because the sacrifices of bulls and goats were not able to change the conscience of man who would still have a mind to sin, but there were offerings that were provided for, sacrifices that were provided for in the law to make atonement for man's sin. And so all this to say that Adam lost a glory, lost a vesture that had a kingship to it when his flesh was intact, though it was corruptible and became corrupt. And so Adam was stripped of his kingship when he fell. And thus, spiritually, he became naked. In Joel chapter 1, verse 7, we have another image of being naked by way of comparing the bark of a tree being stripped from the tree. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. And so when you take off the bark, you see the white of the tree and it is the image of the tree being naked. And so we are talking about the vesture here and how the king of Nineveh took off his royal vesture and how he lost glory in that sense. And we compared that to Adam and to a tree. They lose their own glory and vesture when, in the case of Adam, he sinned and his flesh became corrupt after the fall and he lost his kingship, the dominion over all things, and became a slave to sin, and in the case of a tree, losing its bark, and therefore losing its mantle, its vesture. And so, brothers and sisters, we were talking about the vesture in explaining that God was in Christ. And so God, who is spirit, according to John chapter 4, verse 24, he was in Christ in the body of flesh of the man Jesus Christ, indwelling that body of flesh, that vessel of sinful flesh. And so that's how we get the image of God being a spirit, being covered by his glory of kingship of the Almighty, and then relinquishing that by being covered by sackcloth in the image of sinful flesh. As the spirit of God indwells the human vessel, Jesus Christ, the man, the son of God. And so we're not going to speak about this at length. There is another video on my channel which details this aspect, but just so the scriptures are mentioned, 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. 1 John 3, 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So God laid down his life. Now, how did he do that? As a spirit, he indwelled a mortal human vessel of sinful flesh, and that's the vessel that died. That is the Son of God, Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the man, the Son of God, indwelled by the fullness of the Spirit of God, according to 2 Corinthians 5.19, and this is how God laid down his life. It had to happen through the flesh, because the Spirit cannot die. John 4.24, God is a Spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, as I have mentioned, there is a separate video on my channel concerning these things. I believe the title is God Was in Christ. And so for the purpose of this study, we simply want to highlight how the Spirit of God got up from the throne and set down his crown and relinquished his glorious kingship as a spirit to put on sinful flesh, a vesture that is akin to sackcloth. And he humbled himself being made lower than the angels, being made similar to his brethren of sinful flesh and experiencing the hardship of the flesh, but overcoming it by committing no sin and then defeating that flesh with his spirit, with the power of his spirit, 
the Spirit was glorified, and it was then sent to us that we may do the same thing in our own earthly vessels. Amen. And it is in that regard that we were speaking about the king of Nineveh, how he relinquished his kingship by relinquishing his royal apparel and putting on sackcloth, and came down in that he made himself common among the people and demonstrated alongside them a broken and contrite heart in humbling themselves before the Lord. And the king of Nineveh set the example and made a decree and a proclamation and preached the message of repentance with the nobles in the image of the disciples and the apostles. And everybody repented, having heard the message of God. And everybody humbled themselves, starting with the head, the headship, the king, who gave proper counsel to his people. And this is what God would have liked the priests to do among his people, as they were supposed to be the ones at whose mouth the law was going to be found. So now, brothers and sisters, we have to give credit to the king of Nineveh for getting up and down from the throne and relinquishing his kingship, his royal apparel, and setting down his crown because he understood that it was for the good of his people and that as a leader, he had to set the example. And so this was used as an image to show us that God as a spirit set down his crown and veiled himself in sinful flesh, put on a vesture of sinful flesh, abased himself to be made like unto his brethren, human beings, and suffered humiliation and suffered great sufferings in the flesh to orchestrate our salvation. Now, here's the thing. Satan doesn't want you to give God that credit of having come to save his creation. Satan wants you to believe that a third party separate from God came to repair came to repair or restore creation because he doesn't want you to give God the glory for that. But 2 John verse 7 tells you this, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. This is a verse very much misunderstood in the faith. This verse is a seal concerning the fact that we must recognize that God set down his crown as a spirit in heaven and put on a mantle, a vesture of sinful flesh to come and make himself common among us so that he could secure us and orchestrate our salvation by committing no sin by the power of his spirit. Now, if you have spoken to Muslims, they will tell you that they believe that the man Jesus Christ existed and that he came in the flesh. But what they will not admit or recognize is that he was divine, that the spirit of God was in him such that his spiritual identity was the identity of God in terms of his essence, in terms of his identity spiritually, because we have two identities. We are spirits. And so God as a spirit was in Christ so that the Son of God, the man Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, his spiritual identity is that of God. It's the essence of God. That's how we say that Yeshua, Jesus, is God. But when we look at his earthly identity, the body of flesh, of sinful flesh, the man Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, he was the Son of God. Now, 2 John verse 7 wants you to connect the Spirit of God to the Son of God in the following way. Recognize that God got up and did something to come and save his creation by himself coming to save the creation. God gives his glory to no one. But what other people would want you to believe is that you simply have to confess that Jesus Christ existed and came into the world. And they believe that if they confess that, it's enough. This verse is actually saying you need to confess that Jesus Christ, the man, Yoshua HaMashiach, yes, he came into the flesh. But what this verse is saying, you have to confess that the Spirit of God, Yeshua, as a spirit, 
as God that the Spirit of God came to indwell a vessel of flesh. This is what this verse is saying. And this is a verse a Muslim will not affirm because they do not recognize the divinity of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And many Christians, by not recognizing that God as a spirit came to indwell a vessel of flesh, by refusing that, they are not confessing that Yeshua, the spirit of Yeshua, came in the flesh. Now, many will say, well, the spirit of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua HaMashiach, that spirit is not the spirit of the Lord. Well, if you look to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, you will see that it is made an express mention of the spirit of Jesus Christ. And that spirit was the spirit speaking in the prophets in the old covenant. And we know that it was the spirit of God speaking in the prophets in the old covenant. And therefore, we must understand that what 2 John 7 is saying is that God set his crown down as a spirit and put on a vesture of sinful flesh, that vesture of sackcloth to humble himself. And this is the analogy that I'm making with the king of Nineveh to show you that a king can step down and humble himself. Jesus, Yeshua, did that. And God gives his glory to no one such that he wants you to recognize that he did that and that the son is one with him and that you cannot separate the son where you would say that God did nothing and that the son would be the savior separate from God partaking without the father having anything to do with it. And so all this to say that this verse is saying you must recognize that God as a spirit came to indwell a vessel of flesh. This is what this verse is addressing and not merely stating that Jesus Christ existed in the flesh. Something to which a Muslim would agree, but without recognizing the divinity of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, many people who call themselves saints by denying that the Father came down to put on flesh, they are blaspheming by negating the fact that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, came down and put on flesh and indwelled a vessel of flesh as specifically mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5.19. And as we also understand from 1 John 3.16, where God laid down his life, but as a spirit indwelling a vessel of flesh. But when you deny that God came down, when you deny that, you are blaspheming in light of 2 John verse 7 because you do not confess that the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of God, came down to indwell a vessel of flesh. And so consequently, if you hold that belief, you are being influenced by the spirit of Antichrist. And so 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 10 and 11 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So we see that the prophets in the old covenant, when they were prophesying, they did so by the spirit of Jesus Christ. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 10, starting at verse 10, And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And so we see Saul prophesied. And he did that as the Spirit of God came upon him. And we just read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, that the prophets prophesied by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so the Spirit of Jesus Christ is the Spirit of God. And so now, therefore, in 2 John verse 7, those that do not confess that Yoshua HaMashiach, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, came to indwell a vessel of flesh, well, they are a deceiver and an antichrist. You see? Again, 
The Muslims will confess that Jesus Christ existed in the flesh, but they will never say that his spirit came to indwell a vessel of flesh where that spirit is the spirit of God, according to 2 Corinthians 5.19, so that God would have died through the vessel of flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, according to 1 John 3.16. And therefore, we see the spirit of Jesus Christ is the spirit of God. It is the spirit by which the prophets prophesied, gave you an example with soul. And now 2 John 7, be careful not to blaspheme by saying that the spirit of God did not come down to indwell a vessel of flesh. You are telling God you did not come down to orchestrate my salvation by putting on that vesture of a sinful flesh. You are making that statement when you deny that in Christ there was the spirit of God. When you deny that that spirit of God is actually the spirit of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And so you must acknowledge the double nature of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God indwelled him, and he was a man, and the fullness of the Spirit of God was in him, and the vessel of flesh, that's the Son of God. Those who say God never came down, you are blaspheming in light of 2 John verse 7. And I would say this is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, because you're denying the very work that the Holy Ghost did, that the Holy Spirit did to save you. You're denying the very work that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Yehoshua did to save you. You're denying, to make an analogy, the fact that the king of Nineveh stripped himself of his royal apparel and garment to put on sackcloth. And you're saying that it was a different king that's the image we have with God here. He covered his glory and so relinquished it, covering it with sinful flesh. And when he does that, you don't acknowledge that and say that it's a totally different person who is the vessel of flesh and that the essence of God is not there. And so we read 2 John 7 one last time, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. You can read this this way, who confess not that Jesus Christ, the spirit of Jesus Christ, came to indwell a vessel of flesh. That Jesus came to indwell a vessel of flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist who denies the very excellent work that God did by coming down to indwell a vessel of flesh made akin to us, to secure us, and to condemn sin in the flesh. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, also a verse that is part of the scriptures, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Yoshua HaMashiach. Alleluia. And so, brothers and sisters, there was a need for God to intervene because of the fall of men because God saw that the heart of man was wicked. Genesis chapter six, verse five, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And so likewise, the king of Nineveh realized that his nation was wicked, starting with him. And it grieved him, and he understood that there was a need for them to repent, and that there was an atonement to be sought. His nation and himself, they needed to afflict themselves so that God would reinstate them in righteousness. And so the analogy here is not perfect with God, because again, God did no sin. But God saw that man had corrupt himself on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And he saw that men did not have power to overcome the wickedness in his heart. And so God who created man took it upon himself to come down and relinquished his vesture, his royal apparel, his kingship, and set down his crown and became common amongst the people and put on the same sinful flesh to defeat it. Alleluia. Just like the king of Nineveh, 
understood the condition of his people and relinquished his own vesture, his royal apparel, to put on sackcloth and sit in ashes. Now, let me ask you something. Jonah chapter 1 verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. So there was wickedness in Nineveh. The king of Nineveh presided over a nation that was wicked. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? The people of Nineveh, on top of being wicked, did not know their left from their right. Now, let me ask you a question. The king of Nineveh was part of these people. Let me ask you a question. Did the king of Nineveh not get up from his throne? Did the king of Nineveh not set down his crown and abase himself for the well-being of his people? He did. So let me ask you this. Are you saying that the king of Nineveh at the head of a wicked people, that the king of Nineveh, at the head of many people that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, that this king of Nineveh is better than God Almighty? So the king of Nineveh had more sense than God that he would come down from his throne and set down his crown and afflict himself and have a broken and contrite spirit, being the sinner that he was, being that he was at the head of a wicked people who knew not their left from their right, but he had sense enough to repent and afflict himself, and he is better than God Almighty, who seeing the wicked hearts of men would not get up from his throne, set down his crown, and come down to save us. So the king of Nineveh, a sinner, is smarter than God. He's greater than God. He has more courage than God. He has more glory than God. Think this through. Those of you who say that God Almighty did not get up from his throne, pray about it. Because there is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit according to 2 John 7. When you're denying the very foundation of the work of the Almighty who came down to orchestrate your salvation, is the king of Nineveh greater than he? I let you answer the question for yourself. Verse 6, Jonah chapter 3. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. A sinner did that. Verse 7, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So you see here that the beasts are involved. And we just read in Jonah 4.11 that the Lord said there is much cattle there. Verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. That's another aspect I want to touch on now. The fact that the beasts were involved in the act of repentance according to the decree and the proclamation of the king of Nineveh. Remember the story in Daniel chapter 4 about King Nebuchadnezzar, how he was made akin to cattle, to oxen. Daniel chapter 4, starting at verse 28. All this came upon the King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power? and for the honor of my majesty? Verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. 
and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. And his body was met with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Verse 34, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? You think it's far-fetched that the Lord came down? Who asked you? if you thought that it was possible or not. None can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Your approval is not required. Verse 36, at the same time, my reason returned unto me and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me and my counselors and my lords sought unto me and I was established in my kingdom and excellent majesty was added unto me. And so he was reinstated after a period of humbling himself before the Lord and this by force, he was reinstated. He had to set down his crown for a time and then he recuperated it. And he was made equal to the animals. And this is interesting because we had at a first level, God making himself equal to man for a time equal in the sense that he put on sinful flesh, that is. And now we have Nebuchadnezzar who was made equal to the beasts in that he was eating like them and living like them. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. And so Nebuchadnezzar was made like a beast. And this is to humble us in understanding that there is no preeminence of man over beast when it comes to having the breath of life and in the flesh being mortal. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 19, for that which befalleth the sons of man befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Now, obviously, the exclusive prerogative of man is that he is made in the image of God, and that is not the case of the animals. But as far as their common flesh nature, they both go to the dust again, man and beast. And what befalleth one can befall the other, and they can die alike. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so, the king of Nineveh, by involving the animals, he's reminding us that the whole creation is corrupt because of the fall of man. And the whole creation is waiting for God to make things right, for God to restore all things. Romans 8.22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. As you know, the scriptures say, that the bear and the cow shall eat one next to another. That is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 7. And so this is why the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. 
God does care about the animals and does answer their cries for help. In Joel chapter 1, verse 20, the beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And this is God's answer. Joel chapter 2, verse 22, be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. You see, so the animals know that even though man can be their master on the earth, they know that God Almighty is their creator. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3, the ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. And so the ox knoweth his earthly owner, but we saw that when there's a famine and a drought, the animals call unto God and not men, because they realize that man is limited. Now, the other aspect of this verse is that the animals know to call to God, but yet ironically, Israel, contrary not only to the people who are not the people of God, the barbarians, the Assyrians of Nineveh, Israel doth not know that God rules over them. And so we just saw in Joel chapter 1, verse 20, that the animals, the beasts of the field, they cry to God when there are problems. Whereas Israel doth not consider to call out to God, who is there to answer when he is called upon. Psalm 50 and 15, And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, we go back to the beginning, to Jonah chapter 3, at verse 6. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. We dealt with the fact that he was the king of Nineveh, the head, and gave proper counsel. And he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him. We dealt with the fact that he set aside his royal vesture and apparel and that he put on sackcloth in the image of sinful flesh and sat in ashes, the image of a broken and contrite heart. And we saw that the king was able to deem it necessary for the salvation of his people, that he would come down from his throne, set down his crown and proclaim and publish a decree, which would be the image of the good news of Jesus Christ, calling to repentance. And that the king, along with his nobles in the image of the disciples and the apostles, would proclaim that message as well, calling to deny the lusts of the flesh and suffer for a time in affliction so that we can escape the wrath of God. We also just explained how the beasts were involved in that plan and made a comparison between man and beast in that they are the same. There is no preeminence of one over the other in terms of the flesh dying. Although we understand that man is in the image of God, and that is his exclusive prerogative. And we saw that as God made himself equal to man in terms of having sinful flesh like him and abased himself for a time, we also saw how man can be abased in terms of his understanding and knowledge, which is above that of the animal. Man can be abased that way, and Nebuchadnezzar was made akin to a beast. We said there is no preeminence, we're talking about the flesh, but regarding the intellect, man has a superior intellect and Nebuchadnezzar's intellect was taken away from him and he was made akin to a beast. And this I mentioned to show the image of how man can be abased also with respect to the animal kingdom, as God can also abase himself by putting on sinful flesh to be at our level. And so, brothers and sisters, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 22, we read, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Jews require a sign. They expected a Savior, a Mashiach, that would have a certain stature, 
and prestige according to the world. And so that's what they expected their savior to look like. And so they did not recognize the Lord who came making himself humble and not having beauty nor power in this world that he was manifesting in terms of earthly power. He said his kingdom is not of this world. And so the Jews require a sign because their Mashiach, their savior, could not have been this man who went about on a donkey, an ass, a colt, Matthew chapter 21, verse 6. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they sat him thereon. And so Yeshua, Jesus, when he went to Jerusalem, was riding a colt. That's not what the Jews expected of a savior concerning their Mashiach, savior. And so to them, this Christ, this Mashiach that we preach, it's a stumbling block. Matthew chapter 11, verse 8, But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. And here we have a nice spiritual image of kings wearing soft clothing. The king of Nineveh deprived himself of such soft clothing and put on sackcloth because he left the king's throne. He left the king's house. To make himself common, he left the king's house. Likewise, God, when he left heaven to come and wrap himself in a vessel of flesh, indwelling the sinful flesh of the Son of God, Jesus Christ the man, he set aside his royal apparel for a time and abased himself. He set down his crown for a time and suffered humiliation. Because soft clothing belongs to kings who live in palaces, kings' houses. And so because Yeshua, Jesus, did not have such clothing, the Jews, it was a stumbling block to them that their savior would not have such an apparel, such a royal apparel, which correlates to the fact that Yeshua, Jesus, came specifically with a meek appearance, and thus they did not recognize him. Matthew chapter 6, verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, a king in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Reminding us that kings are dressed in a way that catches the eye. But it was not the case for Yehoshua, Jesus. Because he stripped himself of royal apparel, he stripped himself of kingship, set down his crown, and put on sinful flesh. And here we have the image of the reminder that a king is dressed and arrayed in a spectacular fashion. But the Mashiach, the savior, he came riding a donkey and not having fancy clothes. And spiritually, he had wrapped himself in sackcloth, putting on sinful flesh. And again, this is why the Jews did not recognize him. It was a stumbling block to them. And so the excellent work of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, who came down and humbled himself, set down his crown of glory and put on sinful flesh, it is an excellent work to orchestrate our salvation. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul was asking about this sinful flesh that we have. When will we be delivered of it? because it is a vesture that is in the image of sackcloth, and we want a white robe. We want a garment of glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? We await the moment where the vesture that we have, which was of corruptible seed and was corrupt at the fall of man, we await the moment when we can change vesture and put on incorruption and have a glorified body. And the author of our salvation, 
the author of our redemption, again, we give glory to the Lord, Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. He is the architect of all these things because he set down his crown and came down to orchestrate our salvation. Because indeed, brothers and sisters, it is not a new phenomenon that the Lord would come down. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 21, in the case of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God himself was speaking. Verse 21, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. This was God himself having come down on earth in some physical vessel to examine things. And so we must not be surprised that God can come down because he can so choose to do, being almighty, to come and see things for himself in the creation. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And then the Lord went to inquire about the state of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because we serve a great God, and he can see all things, brothers and sisters. He can come down, or he can get the information any way he so chooses. He's omniscient. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God can choose to look at things in whatsoever way he chooses. He can decide to come down. He can decide to see it from a distance, and he can decide to use agents to get information. I like this verse in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 8. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, his hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. Verse 10, for who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. And so the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, we give glory to the Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, who saved us. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And again, the analogy with the king of Nineveh is that he showed obedience to the warning, and many were spared the wrath of God because of him, since he was in a headship position. Now again, he's not the Mashiach, he's not Yoshua, he's not Jesus. We're using spiritual images to get instruction because we are studying scriptures because the scriptures testify of Yeshua, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. A body hast thou prepared me. The spirit of Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, came to indwell a body that was prepared for him. Amen. Again, he put on a vesture of sinful flesh, he put on the image of sackcloth to humble himself and be afflicted, all for the sake of orchestrating our salvation by his perfect sacrifice, which was superior to the sacrifice of bulls and goats, whose blood could not provide the remission of sins 
renew our conscience and provide an eternal sacrifice once and for all. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Still in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And so the Lord Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, was offered as a one-time sacrifice, perfect. And there is no need for further sacrifices. And his blood is greater than the blood of bulls and goats and renews the conscience so that man no longer has a conscience to sin though he will fight the lusts of his flesh, and there will be a war between the spirit and the body who are contrary the one to the other. James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And this is pertaining to the flesh, because as pertaining to the mind, our conscience is renewed. This is why 1 John chapter 3, verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, no more willful sin. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And so the conscience is renewed, that we don't purposely go out to sin. Now, we can sin accidentally when we succumb to the lusts of our flesh, in which case we can repent and God will forgive us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And so, brothers and sisters, putting all things together, we have seen that the Lord has put together an excellent and perfect plan to orchestrate our salvation so that we who were in darkness were able to perceive his light and receive it when we were also in error, in darkness, and he came as a light to save us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. And so he came and preached peace to you which were afar off. And so the people of Nineveh, they heard from Jonah the preaching that God bid him to preach. 
Remember in Jonah chapter 3, verse 2, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And the preaching that was preached and heard by the king of Nineveh was unto repentance. And likewise, we who were in darkness, just like the people of Nineveh did not know their left from their right and were of a great wickedness, we heard the gospel. It was preached. We saw the light. And what was preached to us was what the Lord put in the mouth of those who preached unto us that which the Lord bid them. And the Lord, if we use the image of the king of Nineveh, he had nobles with him. And those are the image servants and the apostles and the disciples of the Lord, Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, who also take part in the decree and the proclamation of the warning or the good news of the Lord about eternal life. As we read in verse 7, a message of repentance, of a contrite and a broken heart, so that we can have communion with the Lord, receive him, put our faith on him, and get eternal life by abiding until the end in his commandments. Alleluia. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And so, brothers and sisters, after having read and examined the scriptures, we can only give glory to the Lord Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, for everything that he does. Psalm chapter 9, verse 20. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22. Cease ye from men whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Oh, the Lord is in his holy temple, my friends. But there was a time, as was the case in Genesis chapter 18, verse 21, that he came down, I will go down, because he had sent his prophets, and the people did not listen, and therefore he sent the Son, and he himself, the Spirit of the Almighty, indwelled the vessel of flesh, that is the Son of God, the man Jesus Christ, and he proclaimed the message, being preceded by John the Baptist. And so the Lord set down his crown and put on, rather than his royal apparel, rather than his kingship and his vesture of fine linen that princes wear in palaces, that kings wear in royal palaces, he put on sinful flesh in the image of sackcloth. And he humbled himself and suffered humiliation in the image of sitting in the ashes. He set down his crown and stepped down from his throne and humbled himself for a time so that he could come and be the perfect sacrifice so that we may have remission of sins. To reconcile us unto him. Acts chapter 20 verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. Alleluia. Jonah chapter 3. 
And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. God sends out messengers, and the saints are the light of the world. And they preach the message that they have been given, the message of the good news of the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Verse 3, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. The task seemed great, but he could do all things through Christ. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried, Cry upon the housetops, be an evangelist in season, out of season, and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The Lord does not acquit the wicked. He is slow to anger, but there comes a time when those who stiffen their neck will be destroyed speedily and without remedy. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. So they gave heed and believed the message. They believed God. Whereas Israel and Judah had been stiff-necked, a people who were not the people of the Lord, the people of Assyria in Nineveh, hearkened unto the Lord. And they hearkened unto the message that was proclaimed by Jonah, where the people of the Lord had a hard time hearkening unto John the Baptist and Yehoshua, Jesus. And this speaks to us about eventually the message according to which the nations, a people who are not the Lord's people, will become his people. Now, we understand here that Nineveh in Assyria, they are the enemies of the Lord, and they are a rod between his hand, but we're using spiritual images for our edification and instruction. Because the Lord did say that the scriptures testify of him. And so they proclaim the fast, broken and contrite heart, a proper sacrifice offering your life to the Lord and allowing him to use you in whatsoever way he wants to use you and making sure you're letting Christ live in you. You're letting Mashiach take over your life because it is no longer you who liveth, but him in you. And you deny the lusts of your flesh, you crucify your flesh every day. Verse 6, for word came unto the king of Nineveh, to the head, he who could give counsel to the others, and be a leader, and set an example. And he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him. He rose from his throne, took responsibility, and stripped himself of his glory, of his royal apparel, of his vesture, of fine linen, that kings wear in palaces, and covered him with sackcloth. He put on sinful flesh. He made himself common amongst the common people, amongst human beings in their condition of affliction and sat in ashes and suffered humiliation and endured. Verse seven, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. And so he caused it that the message of the gospel would be preached, that the message of repentance would be preached, not only by himself, but by his disciples, his apostles, and those he calls to do so. And it's a message of repentance that calls unto not looking to the things of this world, but looking at the things that are spiritual, that are heavenly, because there our treasure will not rot. Crucify the flesh. Our kingdom is not of this world. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, because there is another place where we can eat and drink without money. Let them not feed nor drink water. And so the animals are involved, because their whole creation groaneth after the Lord to restore all things. And so the king of Nineveh understood that the whole land the whole creation had to be put in repentance. Although man being the head, he's responsible for this situation. And so the king of Nineveh sets himself as an example 
the Lord set himself as an example, afflicting himself and taking the iniquity that was ours and bearing it on his shoulders and showing us the way on how to repent and live a humble life and to love others and to stay clear of sin, for he did no sin. Verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Cry unto me in your day of affliction, and I will answer you. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Repent and believe the gospel, for the kingdom is at hand. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Because God did notice how Ahab still humbled himself when he was corrected by God. And the sanction, the penalty that he was to suffer was going to be delayed unto his son's generation. But at the same time, there were prophecies spoken about him that would not allow him to be unpunished for the evil that he did, for his house was going to be struck and his wife Jezebel eaten by dogs. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Fear God and so seek righteousness and hope that you find grace and that it be given you to do of the Lord's will, to partake in his sufferings and to believe on him and have faith on him. Verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Micah chapter seven, verse 18, who is a God like unto thee? that perdoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. The Lord Yehoshua HaMashiach laid down his crown, stripped himself of glory, and came among us to indwell a vessel of flesh, the flesh of the man Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Spirit of the Father was in him. The Spirit of God was in him, the fullness of it, such that his spiritual identity is that of God, and his earthly identity is that of the man, Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the man. We must confess that the Lord came down to indwell a vessel of flesh, and understand that he did not stay indifferent and that he did not send a separate party to solve a problem concerning the creation that he set up. Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is come in the flesh, meaning has come to indwell a vessel of flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The Muslims say it, Jesus existed, but he's not God. In other words, the spirit of God did not come down to indwell a vessel of flesh. Are you a saint, a Christian, or are you a Muslim? The king of Nineveh was part of a wicked nation who did not know its left from its right. He was a sinner. He got up and came down from his throne and put on sackcloth and relinquished his royal apparel his vesture of fine linen of kings and palaces. Is he better than the Lord Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ? May you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Yoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the almighty King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Glory to you, my Father and King, the Prince of the kings of the earth. Hallelujah. Amen.